go across into Malaysia, not far from here in Ponte, you will find a few. Uh, but this is probably one of the, I mean, to my opinion, this is the best, or uh, the most beautifully looking uh, trogon that you can find. It's a mountain bird, it's living on the mountain slopes. Uh, it takes a little bit of effort, but it can be seen uh, on the slopes of Mount Kinabalu. Uh, in, uh, in, in, in Sabah. Uh, I mean, trogons are not abundant birds, they don't, they don't come in flocks, uh, but if you spend time walking the forest trails there, uh, you'll end up maybe uh, being lucky and, and seeing one of those uh, beautiful birds uh, staring at you, uh, sitting on a branch. Uh, if you behave properly, actually, if you don't make too many movements, if you just wait, uh, those birds can be very, very tame and actually come and perch very, very close from you. Um, they are very beautiful birds to actually uh, watch and observe. I'm not sure what's going to be next. <laughs> right. Uh, hornbills. Uh, you have uh, pied hornbill and black hornbill here, right? Uh, well, you know there are quite a few more if you go across. Uh, into Malaysia, probably 10 species or something like that. There are a few more being found in the north. And if you go eastward across to the Philippines, uh, you will find quite a number of species which are endemic to the Philippines, and some of them being actually endemic to a few islands of the Philippines. This is a Walden's hornbill. Uh, it is found only in the uh, western Visayas. So if you're not familiar with the uh, Philippine archipelago, the big island in the north is Luzon, the big island in the south is Mindanao, and in between pretty much you've got the Visayas. Um, the main island of the Visayas is Negros, but the forest has been taken down there badly, so it's probably extinct mm -hmm. from Negros. Uh, and you need to go to the neighboring island of Panay, where hopefully there are still some forests remaining, and so the situation is not great uh, to see this bird. It's a critically endangered uh, bird, um, so it's one of the most threatened hornbill you can find, probably sitting next to its neighbor, the Sulu uh, hornbill, uh, further south, uh, living in the Tawi Tawi uh, archipelago. Uh, it takes a little bit of a walk uh, to find the bird. Uh, but uh, there are a few pretty reliable places on the island of Pane uh, where, where you can actually uh, uh, see those uh, hornbills. We're still in the Philippines. Uh, we obviously changed genus. We're not talking broadbills. Uh, again, a family which is found uh, mostly in, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, a pretty popular family, I mean, photographers, bird watchers like hornbills, uh, green hornbill, long-tail hornbill, uh, broadbill, 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 and this is a Visayan broadbill, uh, so we're in the same area as a hornbill, but we're in the eastern part of the archipelago. It's been taken on the island of uh, Samar. Uh, and it's a, it's a rare bird. Uh, it's not a bird that you get to see very easily. It's a very inconspicuous bird. Uh, the species you find in Southeast Asia are pretty uh, vocal and you can locate them by voice pretty easily. It's, quite, it's pretty silent. Uh, so it took me quite some time to actually uh, find it. So this broadbill in particular is also pretty small. Uh, it's the size of a black and yellow broadbill, roughly. So it's not a, it's not a big, large size uh, broadbill. The good thing with this bird is that once you find it, it tends to sit on a branch for a long time. <laughs> so you just have to, uh, you know, be very careful, move slowly, try to find a good angle, and, and then finally you can, uh, you can, uh, you can get a picture. Uh, I would definitely pick it up as one of my favorite broadbills. Uh, occurring in Asia, even so on Borneo, you have some very, very good uh, competitors. Uh, you've probably heard of the Whitehead's Broadbill and the, and the Hoses Broadbill, so large wing broadbills, which are also beautiful. 
but it just happens that I have a better picture of this one, so that's the one I'm showing right now. Design broad build. Design broad build. Struggle. Next bird is going to be. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, obviously a very popular genus of uh, family of birds, uh, pitas. Uh, we're actually having a pita specialist uh, here, here with us. So there had to be uh, among 25 great birds of Asia. There had to be a pita. Uh, I'm contending that this is one of the best pitas. Uh, this is the top three of the best pitas you can find uh, in in Asia. This one is a blue banded pita. Did I say it right? <laughs> it's a blue banded pita. It occurs. It's an endemic of Borneo. Uh, so it occurs in, uh, in Sabah, in Sarawak, and uh, on Kalimantan. Uh, it's a hill bird, it's not really found in the lowlands, it's not really found uh, in higher mountains, it's on hill slopes. Uh, it's a pretty shy bird like old pita. Uh, it takes some time, but in the end, if you're a little bit lucky, you'll, uh, you'll get to see it, uh, you'll get to see it well. Kintra, what is your favorite pita? <laughs> oh. All of them? <laughs> All the three species. All the three species. You know there are more pitas now, right? Yeah, wow. Well. <laughs> it's, it's not a bird that has a particular conservation concern for now. Uh, it's still considered relatively common, even so it's always very hard to find. This is a pita of the north. <laughs> it's a waxwing. Uh, it's a Japanese waxwing, to be precise. There are three species of uh, waxwings, uh, two being found in the uh, Palearctic, northern Palearctic, and one being found in Northern America. Uh, this bird is uh, improperly named, actually, Japanese waxwing, because it doesn't breed in Japan. <laughs> uh, it only winters in Japan, and not in huge numbers. Uh, so it's basically uh, the Japan equivalent of a jumbo fruit dog in Singapore, right? <laughs> if one turns up or a flock turns up, then a lot of people will be after it. Uh, I was very lucky to find a flock uh, two years ago, right at the bottom of Mount Fuji, uh, on the shores of Lake Yamanakako, uh, if you happen to have traveled to Japan. Uh, it was in winter, there was uh, snow around, it was a beautiful day, uh, and there was this flock of uh, absolutely cracking birds. Uh, around. Uh, they actually breed in uh, southeast Siberia and northeast China. They are also found in winter around Beijing. So they are also very, very uh, popular birds. But again, that's the kind of birds you can't really rely on uh, uh, because they are very nomadic, very unpredictable, just like the jumbo fruit. Though. They turn up in a place and the next day they are gone. Uh, sometimes they might stay a few weeks in an area, but it's really rare. So they move around a lot, and uh, seeing one actually takes some effort. It's a near threatened or vulnerable bird, I think. So it has a little bit of a concern. Uh, it's a near threatened bird, right? So I think that the uh, situation in terms of conservation is, uh, is, is not great. Um, well, even so, if you look at the breeding habitat, there are probably still uh, quite a few forests standing in southeastern Siberia. <coughs> Right, we're moving to the uh, realm of babblers. Uh, you're all familiar with babblers, you know there are a lot of them. Uh, it's difficult to pick one. Uh, I picked a bird which is endemic to Vietnam, which actually is also improperly named uh, short-tailed skimitar babbler. Uh, but actually it's not a skimitar babbler, technically it's probably more like a long-billed wren babbler. I don't know if you're familiar with these birds. Uh, it's a ground babbler, basically, a Pelo Hermidae. A bird which uh, skulks, <laughs> a bird which uh, hugs the ground, uh, a bird which is pretty uncommon. Uh, and I was very, very lucky to actually get this opportunity to have one hopping onto the log. I was actually not aiming at this bird when I took the picture. I was aiming at the laughing thrush, which never turned up, <laughs> but I was, uh, I was quite happy to have this one, uh, uh, this one instead. Uh, it's unique in, in its genus. Uh, its genus is actually called Jabouillea, named uh, uh, from a French ornithologist. We have a few of them. 
uh, and it actually has a, 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 a sister species which has been uh, recently found in northern Myanmar, which might or might not be a different species actually. Uh, but so Vietnam has a lot of great birds, a lot of endemic birds, and, and this is a, a pretty tough, tough bird to, to, to crack and to see, so I was very, very lucky and uh, happy to see this one and take a picture. Uh, it's, it's very nice. Just checking the, um, the status. Uh, it's actually a near threatened bird, but I would rather call it a data deficient bird because not much is known in terms of uh, population uh, exact distribution. Where was that taken? So it was taken in Kantum, in central Vietnam, basically. So you were going after the golden main laughing trash? Yes, it was close from there. What's the name of the bird? Sorry, it's a short tailed skimitar bugger. Short tailed. Like a short tailed babbler, but skinny tar. <laughs> How do you spell it? Skinny tar. S C I M I T A R. Yes. Babbler. All right, this is, this is a thrush. Uh, uh, this is a Sri Lanka thrush. Sri Lanka, so it's uh, an endemic bird of Sri Lanka, this uh, nice island south of India, uh, which is quite a number of endemic birds, this one being one of the most difficult to, uh, to see, so again, very happy to see uh, this bird and take this picture together with actually uh, Mr. Lowe and Mr. Visit who are sitting here, uh, who actually brought me to this bird, because I was looking in another direction when the bird turned up and they uh, very kindly brought me to this bird and amazingly because thrushes are pretty shy birds this bird just sat for what five ten minutes without moving on this branch uh, giving a, an incredible an incredible look uh, a little bit of taxonomy for those who like it uh, so it belongs to the uh, white thrush slash scaly thrush complex uh, it's a lot of species in there, <laughs> don't know how many, it used to be uh, seen as just one bird and then people started to split uh, those birds into different species. Basically you have the white thrush which is a migratory bird breeding up in Siberia and, and, and flying through uh, China to winter in, in Japan and further south into, into the Philippines. And then you have a number of very similarly looking birds called scaly thrushes, uh, which are actually resident and only found in certain areas. So one of them is uh, endemic to Sri Lanka, one of them is endemic to the Nilgiri Mountains of South India, there is one endemic to uh, Indonesia, the horsefield thrush, there is one endemic to Taiwan recently found. Um, Taxonomies don't really know whether it's how many species are involved. Um, they look pretty similar even so this one is very, very distinctive, it's a very long powerful bill and, and, and a very buffy tinge uh, on the uh, on the border of the, of the wing feather and also uh, also the underparts. There has to be a, a few robins as well. Uh, this is a fire throat, fire throat, which is a uh, a bird which is a breeding endemic of China. So it only breeds uh, in China, in central western China, probably Sichuan is probably the uh, epicenter of, uh, of the breeding branch. Uh, it winters further south uh, in Indochina, probably all the way to northeast India. Uh, very tough to find in winter. Actually, uh, there was a bird which was found in northern Thailand recently wintering and it was one of the first observations there even though it probably breeds in fairly good numbers, it probably winters in fairly good numbers in, in this area. It's very hard to find in, uh, in winter so your best chance is to go and see it on the breeding grounds. Uh, this was taken uh, in a place called Banong Chan uh, in a national park called Wolong. Uh, which is pretty near from Chengdu. Wolong is mostly known for being an area for a giant panda. Uh, there is a beautiful forest there and if you look for this bird around 2,500, 3,000 meters in the forest, uh, if you listen for its song in spring, uh, then you have a chance to, uh, to actually see it. 
Uh, they are pretty skulking birds, uh, like all robins. But of course, if you do a little bit, a little bit of uh, playback, uh, the male will get curious and come and see you, uh, and maybe, like in this case, give you a, a, a great uh, photo opportunity. Fire throat. It's a near threatened bird. Uh, not very, not endangered, but uh, not a big population either. But my favorite robin is probably this one. Um, it's not called a robin, it's a Gould's short wing. Gould's short wing. Uh, same family as the robins. It's actually unique in its genus. Uh, it's a bird of the uh, south of the, uh, sorry, eastern Himalayas. Uh, it's found uh, in northeast India. Uh, it's found also in Myanmar. It's found in uh, uh, extreme southwestern Yunnan. Uh, so in areas which are not very visited. Uh, also a bird which is very hard to find in winter. Uh, very skulking bird. And it breeds actually unlike the fire throat which still breeds in the forest. This bird breeds actually above the tree line. So you have to go up to 4,000 meters uh, high to actually have the chance to find this bird breeding uh, basically among boulders and, and, and weekends there is no more tree uh, around there. This was uh, taken in an area called Sela Pass, which is in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, and it was taken uh, 22nd of May, if I remember well. So it was taken just right when the first birds start to arrive on the breeding grounds. Uh, and I was actually very, very lucky to find a bird uh, on that day. We went one day up there. Uh, after a few hours, we thought that the birds had not arrived, so we started to be uh, very depressed. And of course, the next thing is that the clouds started to roll in, so we couldn't see five. I couldn't see uh, King Chua. I mean, it was just you know that bad. Uh, I still, you know, decided I would wait a little bit for my luck, and then uh, for some reason the clouds lifted, and then I saw a bird on the ground. I waited a little bit, and it just jumped on the rock, and I could take a picture. So it was really one of my luckiest uh, pictures uh, of this cool shot. Right, we, we skipped quite a few pictures. I don't know if we're going to, uh, <laughs> to recover them later. Uh, does someone know what this bird is? <laughs> All right, so it's, uh, it's actually a Silems mountain finch. <laughs> uh, it's uh, young, famous because of this finch. Yeah, right, it's, uh, it's a bird I was very, very lucky to uh, rediscover uh, five years ago now. Uh, in Western Shanghai, so basically on the Tibetan Plateau, uh, 5,000 meters elevation. I was doing a trek, I had my camera, I saw a bird, I took a picture, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> uh, I was very tired at the moment, I didn't, I didn't really care about it. I came back and looked into the books and saw, well, this might be this bird, so I sent my picture to uh, Chris Kaspersiak, who is running the uh, Oriental Bird Image uh, website, which you might be familiar with, uh, and within 10 minutes he replied to me and said, I think you just rediscovered uh, Sealand's Mountain Finch. Uh, and actually, I didn't put the picture of the male, I didn't put the picture of the female, uh, because at the time of the rediscovery, uh, we knew how the uh, male looked like, because specimens had been collected almost 100 years ago, but we didn't know how the female uh, looked like. So this is uh, actually a female Silems mountain finch. Uh, and later on, taxonomists uh, stepped in and looked at this bird. Uh, actually, the female of this bird looks very much like the female of the Tibetan rose finch. Uh, and they found out that actually the Silems mountain finch was not a mountain finch anymore, but was actually more of a rose finch. Uh, an aberrant rose finch because the male has no pink at all. So uh, the status of this bird is data deficient <laughs> for the uh, simple reason that there is only one location where this bird is known, which is the exact location where I saw it. Uh, a few adventurous birders went on to try to see this bird. 
they only saw it at the exact same location, the exact same GPS spot, or within a few hundred meters around. Uh, I went back to the area the year after we discovered it. I explored a wider area with different slopes, different uh, valleys, and I couldn't find another place where this bird was occurring. Uh, I think a few bird quest tours went specially to see this bird. They were able to see it again in the same location. They were not able to see it anywhere else. Um, so very mysterious bird. Uh, it occurs at 5,000 meters and probably above, so possibly the highest bird in terms of elevation. Uh, as you probably can see, the uh, primary projection, the wings are very, very long, almost reaching the, uh, the, the tip of the tail uh, to basically give the ability of the bird to fly uh, at very high elevation where the air is very thin. So it's, uh, well, it's not a very spectacular bird, but it's, uh, it's an interesting bird at least. Cillian's mountain finch. <laughs> Right, um, this is a bunting, this is a yellow breasted bunting, uh, male. Uh, this picture was taken in Eastern Mongolia uh, in June, so on the breeding grounds. Uh, birds were singing and were uh, pretty uh, easy to spot. Uh, it's a bird which had a catastrophic decline in terms of population over the last 20, 30 years. It used to be truly abundant. Uh, you used to have wintering flocks of hundreds of birds, if not more, in Indochina, in uh, southern China, in uh, northern Thailand. Uh, but the population window crashed uh, very, very quickly, mostly because of one factor, because of trapping for food. Uh, it's actually a delicacy in uh, South China. Uh, and uh, people getting richer and richer were able to put more and more money actually uh, hit just one bird uh, and of course there were uh, farmers and people living in the countryside were putting up uh, mist nets to trap this bird. Um, it is now listed as endangered. Uh, how much of the population is remaining uh, it's really unknown. Uh, the problem with the passerines is that it's very difficult to actually evaluate the population of the passerine. Uh, a short bird, a large bird, you know, you can figure out because you know where to look for them. Uh, the range of those passerines is so wide and large that it's very, very difficult to make an estimate of the population. 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 20, I don't know. Nobody actually knows, uh, but it's for sure that where the birds used to occur in hundreds and thousands, they almost completely gone and you only see small flocks nowadays. This actually was the uh, cover of the Fox yeah. <laughs> magazine. Right, the problem is, no, I mean, I did the wrong, uh, the problem is we skipped a few pictures. And I, we still have time, right? We still have 20 minutes. I hope we can fix it. With some help. <laughs> there are pictures that did not appear. 12, 13, 14, actually, three pictures. So you add them to 15. Uh, meanwhile, if you have any questions uh, about this, please <coughs> ask. Yes, Can you sure. Can share with us some of the lenses that you use? Sure. Uh, 600, <laughs> <laughs> mostly. Uh, sometimes with an extender, sometimes without. But yes, most of these pictures have been taken with, uh, with a long lens. I'm trying to think about a picture where I didn't need a long lens, but I can't really uh, think of any. I wish the birds were closer, mm -hmm. uh, but in most cases they were not. Uh, probably the, um, the the Siberian crane, I could have probably shown a picture taken with a little bit of a wider angle. Uh, even so when you're shooting in Maipo, you have a backdrop of the Shenzhen buildings and you know skyscrapers, so you, you don't want to have it too wide either. You, you want to narrow it a little bit. 
it. So, uh, but the other birds, yeah, I can't think of a bird that comes really close enough for uh, for a wider uh, lens. Even so, as a photographer, I much, much, much prefer when I have, uh, when I'm given the opportunity to uh, be able to take a picture with a uh, with with wider lens. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, is there any reason to just wear the pose at winter? Because it surely they don't need to try to the meters out of the winter. That's absolutely impossible. So it must go in winter as well. I mean, lower altitude, for example. Because there's definitely no school in the winter. Or would there be? Because from January up to onwards, it would be covered in snow. It's quite a considerable amount of snow. So I doubt that it would. It actually might just stay where it is. <laughs> okay. I mean, what's the snow situation? Okay. Uh, the, the, there's not much snow in winter there. Uh, there is snow, but there's not much snow. I mean, we're, we're not we're not talking Hokkaido. We're not you know. So there is a little bit of snow coming in, and there is a lot of wind. So wind is actually blowing the snow into certain areas, and other areas are actually completely devoid of snow. So most probably they still hang around. They probably move a little bit. Uh, but they certainly don't migrate like past the Himalayas down into India. We're not talking about anything like that. There, there might be some movement, um, but they will be able to find stuff on the ground, typically dry seeds. Yeah. Uh, and that's Today's probably no, what they are. No, close snow, even after no, I mean, again, it's there are situations in this region where you might have a strong snowfall, which actually might spell trouble for those birds. Um, but in most of cases, there will still be areas where the wind is strong enough to blow it away, and where they will be able to go between the rocks and pick up the few seeds. Again, no. I, I've been there in winter. Um, there is not much snow. Uh, there is some snow on some slopes, and no snow at all on other slopes. It's definitely very cold. Uh, there's definitely a lot of ice, there's no more really water running or, or anything. Uh, but even during the day when the, when the sun comes, there's a little bit of water dripping, so they're probably uh, able to uh, drink a little bit from that. And for the rest, I think they just pick up the dry seeds. Okay. So that might actually account for the fact that it's so localized, because they wouldn't be able to hang out with that out of the It still has to be a uh, farm. <laughs> Uh, nobody has ever seen this bird in winter, to be, to be honest. So, it probably goes around a bit. That, that would be my, my bet. But I don't think it goes very far. Okay, sure. Right, we're, we're covering the last three birds. Uh, this is a tern. Uh, more precisely, this is a Chinese crested tern. Uh, another bird which uh, was actually thought to be extinct for quite a period of time, uh, probably 50, 60 years. Uh, before it was rediscovered uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, it's a bird that breeds basically in southeastern China, somewhere between the coastal China and Taiwan. Probably had a, a, a much bigger distribution ground, the distribution uh, range um, in the old ages, but it shrunk a lot. China developed a lot. Fishermen were able to go and uh, onto all the small islets. They were probably taking the eggs of those birds. Uh, and they were literally thought to be extinct for a long period of time until a few birds were found, uh, yeah, again, back a more than 10 years ago. Uh, and then a, a very bold conservation effort was put together uh, by conservation people, especially based in Hong Kong, uh, to actually try to protect uh, those birds go into the fishermen, tell them not to take the eggs anymore, try to identify the islets where they were still breeding and, and protect them from any people to, uh, to, uh, to land on the island and, and, and pick the eggs. Uh, they try to stimulate breeding by putting decoy birds uh, on, the, uh, on the islands, a technique that actually works, um, attracts birds uh, to come and breed on a, on a given island. Uh, but even with that, the, the, the population of this bird is thought to be around 50 birds, 5 zero. So it's a, it's a very, very uh, low population. Uh, this picture was taken in, uh, in China. It was taken on the estuary of the Min River, Minjiang, in Fujian, uh, not too far from uh, Fuzhou. 
Uh, it's actually an area where the birds gather before the breeding. So if you go there in April or in May, uh, and you go on the sand banks, which are accessible uh, when the tide is low, uh, there is a good chance you'll find a few of them mingled together with the birds on the right, which are uh, greater crested terns, which are much more common. Uh, and you can easily see the difference uh, in terms of uh, basically the wings and the mantle being much, much bigger on this bird and the black tip uh, of the bill. Uh, I was very, very lucky to be able to approach uh, this flock of, of birds as the tide was, uh, was rising and coming in and uh, they even gave me a little bit of a, of a display. Any question? How close were you when you took that photo? Hmm. 20 meters? I was... Uh, I was lying on the ground. I, I, I made a concert for it, actually, uh, you know, just, like, just like on the movie. It, was, I, it took me an hour, literally, to, to come that close. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I was, it was pretty painful for a few days after that. Well, uh, that's Sumatran ground cuckoo. Uh, another bird that was thought extinct or that was sort of lost for almost a hundred years, uh, specimens of this bird were collected uh, in the early 19th century, uh, early 20th century, in the, on the island of Sumatra. Uh, but then nobody really knew where exactly they were coming from. Nobody actually saw them in the wild. Uh, meanwhile, first they were thought to be the same species of the, as the Borneo ground cuckoo, which is uh, found on the island of Borneo. Then people looked at the specimen and started saying, "Oh, it's a different bird." It's actually a bit smaller and the color is a bit different, so it's definitely a distinct species. But people didn't know where to look for until, I think it was in 2006, uh, in the Karinchi National Park, uh, camera traps were being set to actually monitor the activity of mammals, especially tigers. Uh, and people looked at the picture that was taken by the camera and saw this bird, actually. So what is that? Uh, so send a picture to some ornithologists who said, well, this is a Sumatran ground cuckoo. The interesting thing is that the location of this camera trap was known, and of course, quite a few ornithologists went there, tried to look for it, but never found it. <laughs> never found it. Two years, three years, hacking through the jungle, couldn't find it. In another location, uh, about 500 kilometers to the south, in an area called Bukit Baris and Selatan, so we're talking about South Sumatra, uh, an ornithologist called Nick Brickle came in contact with uh, bird trappers and a bird trapper showed basically what he had in the cage and it was a Sumatran gone cuckoo. <laughs> uh, so finally he found the bird so he asked the, uh, the trapper to um, bring him to the place where uh, he found the bird which he did uh, and he was able to see it in the wild. Uh, the bird trapper actually became a bird guide <laughs> and he made some money with people like us <laughs> trying to go and see this bird. Uh, actually since then it was found finally in the Karachi area, uh, I think two years ago. So there are no two localities where you can see this bird. One in the mountains of central Sumatra, Karachi, and still in this location in Bukit Baris and Seradan. I spent quite some time to uh, take this picture it's a picture I'm not completely happy with simply because the bird was way too close. <laughs> I wanted the bird to uh, jump on the log around here. And it didn't. And I was happy I could roughly focus it, but as you can see, the tail is uh, cut and the legs is, 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 there is no crop. It's really, uh, it's really the picture. Uh, it came just way too close. Uh, it lasted a few seconds and it was gone. Uh, it's quite an amazing, uh, quite amazing, an amazing sighting, I would say. Uh, it's a very, very skulking bird, very hard to see. Uh, even so, it's fairly big. It's 50, 55 centimeters, uh, but it skulks. It's always in the uh, in, in the thick uh, vegetation, and, and it's very, very rare to actually see it uh, fully or almost. Fully. Any uh, question on the ground cuckoo? <laughs> Still on the bird, right? <laughs> I'll get it. <laughs> Next year. All right, that's an owl. We needed an owl. I took a very, very cute one, a uh, bird that you might be familiar with. It's an oriental bay owl. Um, 
maybe you know that alls are actually divided in two families. Uh, one of the, the typical alls, like the scopsol and the hock alls, and, and another family is the uh, is the bar alls. Uh, so all those uh, masked all basically, and, and this is one of the smallest of this uh, of this family. It's one of the jungles of, uh, of Southeast Asia. It's not a rare bird so to speak, uh, but it's a very difficult bird to find. Don't tell that the Sorry? Don't tell that the You need it? <laughs> it's, it's a difficult bird to, uh, to crack. It's a, it's a bird that you will hear and then you will try to locate, but it really stays into uh, basically deep thickets. Uh, it loves tangles of... Uh, of, of lioness and vines, uh, and in particular, it never perches on an horizontal branch. It always perches uh, basically on the trunk, on the side of the trunk. Uh, that's a typical posture for this uh, for this bird. Uh, it's a picture that was taken in Thailand in Kang Chan, but you can find this bird in Malaysia. Uh, you can find this bird in Borneo. Uh, you can find this bird in southern China. There are quite a number of places where the bird actually occurs. But again, seeing it is. Um, yeah, it takes a little bit of work. I think we're done. We uh, completed the uh, the missing birds. Any uh, any question? We still have uh, seven minutes. Yes. So, of two thousand three hundred some odd birds that you've seen, how many have you photographed? A little bit over two thousand. Uh, so I'm missing two hundred something. I keep a count. Come on, go after your record. No, I don't think so. No, I I I like taking pictures, but the more I take pictures of birds, the more I enjoy bird watching. <laughs> and actually, recently, I, I surprised myself going out to see birds without a camera, mm -hmm. and actually enjoying it. So um, I'm on both sides now. So. Just to add, I think that there was a question on the camera that uh, you know Jan uses. Sure. So he used the 600mm Canon. So I think most of you would probably use a tripod. He goes around without tripod. So that's why he's able to go uh, such long distances to capture the bird. So basically, I think you look at his muscle. I think he's full of muscle. So just 600 and see carrying that lens, the body out in the forest walking around. So I've gone up with him numerous times. That's how he does is uh, but photography just handheld 600 mm. No, I, I like taking pictures with tripods. I mean, tripods have a lot of uh, situations. The ground cover was taken with a tripod. Uh, each time I basically the strategy is to sit and wait. Uh, you're much better off with a tripod, I can tell you. You can't just stay like that too hours. I just can't do that. Uh, but it's true that not having a tripod, you'll be able to carry. Uh, uh, to carry the, the, the lens around and cover bigger distances. Um, yeah, you have to find ways to actually use your, you know, your, your knee or different parts of your body uh, to lean and to try to stabilize your, uh, your, uh, your, your lens. But um, I mean, it doesn't need a, a 600 millimeters to, uh, to, take, to take good pictures. I mean, that, that's also what I want to say. I have friends who are shooting with 400, with 300. Uh, much shorter lens, much lighter lens, uh, and they achieve uh, very, very good results. Uh, I showed you the picture of the uh, Western Tragopan. I mentioned about my friend uh, Janie Koryakose. She's a woman. Uh, she shoots with a 500. Uh, she hand holds also the lens. Uh, she's very, really, very, very good at that. So you know, it's not a matter of strength. If you get used to carry the thing, if you find the right balance. You can basically take pictures, and you don't need necessarily a big lens to take good pictures. iPhone. <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> show you, show you wrong. That's it. Take it with an iPhone. Same thing you see. There is better than me. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Right, I mentioned that about, uh, I think, the white-bellied heron. Yeah, I mean, those birds breed along rivers uh, which have forests on both sides. So they basically uh, use the river as a way to feed, you know, in the, in the running water, they catch fishes, and they use the, uh, the trees to basically uh, make their nests. 
when there is a dam, everything is flooded. Uh, basically, the rivers is not flowing the same way anymore. Uh, fishes of uh, species of fishes that they were feeding are, are, are disappearing. The trees are being cleared on the side mm -hmm. of the of the river. So basically, the habitat is really, really changed in a way that makes it impossible for the for the bird to keep on breeding. Uh, unfortunately. Any other question? All right. Well. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming and such a Thank Jan for taking time off his busy birding schedule to come here and give us uh, you know, this very interesting talk. So hopefully, I think I'll see, hopefully see more of you out in the field taking some uh, rare birds. So I think uh, to show a uh, token of appreciation, a little book from Ding Mi and from myself. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go, I just want to make an announcement. Uh, October 8th is our bird race. All right. So it's, I think it's not announced yet, but October 8th is, uh, will be our annual uh, Singapore bird race. There will be three categories. All right. Three categories. One, this will be the, uh, you know, the we have a marathon race. All right. Those who fancy doing a 20-hour race. Okay, so we have a marathon, what we call a marathon race. And those who can't spare the time, we have a sprint event, a sprint race. So you have only five hours to spring around Singapore. Right, so that is uh, the second category. And we have our usual photography uh, category as well. All right, so three uh, categories for you to pick. So that will be on October 8th. So do look out for it in the coming newsletter in the Facebook post. All right? Uh, sorry, there's one more. Actually, sorry, I'm just like curious, like, what triggered you to begin wanting to dedicate so much time to taking photos of birds? And... I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> it just happened. I mean, I don't know. I was, um, when I was younger, like a teenager, I went out birding. I was raised in France. My father liked going out, and, uh, and I liked it. And then I got very busy with all the studies and stuff and working, and uh, I completely gave up for more than 20 years. I found myself having a little bit more time suddenly, and I just came back to that. I, just, I don't know, it just came. It just, uh, I was lucky to meet, you know, people who also helped me. I mean, you know, when you were sort of restarting something, I was not very particularly good at bird watching at the time when I sort of started, you know, being interested in it again, and uh, it just, you know, it just, um, just built up uh, upon this. I mean, there are lots of great people, I'm sure, also here <laughs> in this room. I mean, it's a uh, I'm uh, showing the work as being my work, but uh, in most of the cases, I was actually with people uh, doing that. Local guides uh, showing me the birds, uh, people traveling with me, sharing expenses. Uh, a lot of times, I was not the one to to find the birds. It was someone else who was next to me who found the birds. So it's it's also a, a, a group thing, something that you do that you do with friends, that you do with uh, with people. It's not a. Yeah, I was just asking like, if you have like any like if we want to begin bird watching, like what do you have any tips about how? to actually begin in such a... A pair of binoculars? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, join, join the Nature Society for some walks. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, this weekend, there is, uh, Sungai Bolo has a better watch, so feel free to join. Well, you, you start with something like that and a pair of binoculars. Yeah. You go out uh, and you challenge yourself. Each bird that you see, you try to put the name on it. You try to identify it. Yeah. Then you go with someone else again. I mean, you learn with other people mostly. You don't learn by yourself only. It's, it's not true. So try to find other people you know to go with. Uh, people who are more experienced, and you will learn a lot very, very, very quickly. Much better than just going on your own. Yeah, thank you. Go with people. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
What are you going out to town on the car for? You must. Is there any target in your yeah, I think it's the Jumbo Fruta. Wow, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, anyway, good luck. Yeah, I heard I showed up that one afternoon when we were there, but we were actually all walking around, so we totally missed it. Yeah. Oh, must go again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just try to find out when it's a good time. Okay, any time is a good time. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having us. You should have a nice break. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm going to go home. It's all right. Very nice for fun. Enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great place. Yeah. I wish you good luck with the gym. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, but, uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.